Hi there, thank you for joining. My name is Carrie Comstock. I am the Field Marketing Manager for Talent. Um, and thank you very much for joining us for today um, for the Talent and Art the Solutions presentation around data catalog and data governance strategy. While we're waiting folks to join, just a few housekeeping notes. First of all, all guests will be muted during the presentation, but we'll leave about 15 minutes at the end to address any questions. And also, if you have any questions that you want um, addressed, just please put them in the uh, chat box and um, we'll, we'll tackle them at the end of the session. And we definitely encourage you to ask questions. If you have any um, issues at all during the presentation, just let us know in the Q&A box as well. A recording will be available after the session. Today's webinar is going to cover key topics around data governance with Talent's longtime and very trusted partner, Artha Solutions. Key topics that we're going to run over today. Uh, data governance as an accelerator and Talent's data governance framework, an overview of the Talent data catalog solution, and then we're going to turn it over to Artha Solutions to review the data insights platform. Um, they're going to show a use case and a live demo. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Talent Senior Engineer and Data Governance Lead, Catherine Kloster. All yours, Catherine. Great. Thanks, Carrie. Good morning. So this is pretty much a reality for our customers, this slide, um, and, another, and other companies out there, as well as yourselves, right? You're probably wondering, you know, how much data do you have? What are those new data sources that are coming in? Where's that data? Where's it coming from? How do I use it? Who, who has access to it? Is it sensitive? We're seeing a lot of data coming in and, and it's getting inundated. Um, our, it's inundating our customers and ourselves, right? I'm hearing that memory per gigabyte, a penny. We used to talk about uh, gigabytes now and terabytes and petabytes. Now we're hearing zettabytes. So we're seeing a lot of data coming in and our customers and, your, as your, and yourselves struggling with the data. And that's what we're seeing with this slide. So I'm sure you can all agree that data is a crisis that a lot of our companies, a lot of companies are struggling with. So data governance, there's a lot of stigma associated with data governance, right? It, everyone thinks it's that never ending story. Only big companies like AIG can do it and do it successfully. Nobody's really talking about the benefits they're getting out of it. It just seems to keep going on and on. But when you use data governance correctly, when you define those processes and people and you get those things in place, it really becomes an accelerator and that's when you get to see those benefits. And these are some of the ways that data governance can address um, some of these items. So data silos, everyone has them. You're wanting to go in and actually break them down. You want to give your, your users visibility to the data that you have out in your organization. You want to um, go ahead and, and be able to look at that data, know what your users need, be able to ask business questions of the data that's out there. Then data quality. I'm sure everyone has this issue, right? Nobody's alone. There's all kinds of data quality issues out in your, in your environment. You don't know what they are but you're able to go in and improve them and then your users can benefit from them. You're able to go in and make informed decisions versus gut decisions. Then we have, um, that ties into the analytics, right? You wanna have good analytics so you can make smart business decisions. And then policies. Every customer needs to have a data strategy. Where are you gonna fix your data? Where, who's gonna fix it, right? the best people to fix the data is gonna be your, your users. Then you also wanna make sure that the right people are using the data and how should they be using it, right? And then finally, data privacy and compliance. This is a big topic out there. GDPR, CCPA, everybody's having to understand how they can address this, how they can be compliant as well as financial institutions have their own compliance and regulations that they also need to address. So with Talon, this is our framework for addressing data governance. So you'll see we have a mantra, find, trust, and use. So first you wanna find that data, you wanna discover it in your environment, you wanna understand it. You wanna understand the data quality issues and highlight those, right? 
then you're going to delegate, delegate that cleansing. And the cleansing, who best to cleanse your data but your business users, the people who know the data, who know what it should look like, what the data quality issues are, formatting, standardization. Then you want to go ahead and, and organize and empower that data. So you want to create that single source of trust, which is really important. You want to encourage data curation and that interaction with the data. You also want to orchestrate stewardship and have that ownership around the data. And then finally, once it's all cleansed and ready to go, you want to go in and automate and deliver that data. So you're going to use the machine learning that you've uh, used in previously, and you want to use that to quickly remediate your data. Then you want to enable your cloud applications and have them visible, give them visibility into that clean, trustworthy data. And then you also want to go ahead and publish that trusted data, whether that's to your users, uh, your, data, your data scientists, your data analysts, or even to your applications downstream. And you can do that with API services. So with that, after we've done all that, you have complete, compliant, and timely data. And this depicts who's actually directly benefiting from that. Your data architects and engineers, your integration specialists, data stewards, they're all benefiting from that complete, compliant, and timely data. And with them benefiting from that, because the company then can turn around and use those benefits to its advantage. So they can go in, they can take raw data, they can monetize their data. We see a lot of customers doing that, turning it into revenue, reselling that data. With that data also, you can access, you can access it quickly. You can even ask questions that you were never able to ask before, which is gonna drive innovation, right? Then from that, you're gonna be able to take those innovations and those findings and transform and drive that customer experience, which is gonna make it more effective. And then finally, with that, that's also going to address and reduce any cost or risk that you have. And with that, the way we do it is with our talent data fabric, our fully integrated platform. We've got a variety of different uh, products that can do a variety of different things around data governance, data management, and underlying all of these features and functions is actually data governance. So you have the visibility, the transparency of what's happening with your data, the actions that are being taken upon it, where it's coming from, where it's going to, which is really important, especially from a data governance and data management standpoint. You want to have that visibility. You want to understand what's happening to your data. So with that, what is data catalog? So here's a description that Gartner has provided I'm sure you guys have seen lots of other uh, descriptions of or definitions of data catalog. Some will talk about the fact that it's maybe it's the three features that catalogs are known for, right? Business glossaries, uh, lineage, metadata management. Um, there's also simpler ones. But this kind of gives you a flavor for what data catalog is. And with that data catalog, we get a lot of um, we get a lot of questions around what's supported by data governance, right? What are some of those data governance initiatives that we see that our customers are out there asking? So these are some of the top five that we actually run into. So data democratization kind of goes back to that data governance um, accelerator slide. We have a lot of customers who really don't understand what's out in their environment. They want to have that visibility. And with that visibility, you can understand what's out there. From that, we get a lot of questions and, and requests around data privacy and regulation. Again, this is a big topic. I think data governance is really booming because of the privacy and the regulations and compliance needs that our customers have, right? Everyone's trying to understand how do they address privacy? How do they identify privacy? How do they become compliant, whether they're a financial institution, retail, they want to make sure that they're they're addressing these needs. With the data democratization I mentioned earlier, it's self-service. So self-service, we see some of our customers who have some data governance processes and people in place, and they want to promote self-service. So with those reports that customers are getting, they want to be able to understand what 
what does that data mean? What does this mean to me? What is that field in that report? And then not only that, because they have visibility within what's in their system, they're able to in turn go in and with self-service, ask for more data, be able to ask those more innovative new business questions. And that's gonna start innovating, have giving them the ability to innovate faster, as I mentioned earlier, as a benefit. Data modernization, a lot of customers wanna move from those legacy systems to the cloud. A catalog can provide that visibility. It'll give you impact analysis, show you what systems are being impacted and identify what needs to be moved to the cloud or what doesn't need to be replaced. And then finally, data governance and data quality. I would say this is probably our biggest request um, that we get from our customers today is we have a lot of people out asking, what is data governance? I know I need to do it. Um, I don't really understand it, or we've been given this initiative. We know we've got some data quality issues. We don't really know what they are, but we need to address them because things are starting to get painful, right? I'm sure you guys can relate to that. Um, maybe you're making bad decisions. Maybe your report in one area is say one result or another. We're seeing a lot of that. So with that, we're running into a lot of data governance and data quality initiatives that we need to address. So with the data catalog, it creates a single source of trusted data with these four different features or capabilities. So it automates data crawling. Everybody wants this, right? You wanna connect your data sources, bring in that metadata and automate it. And you can do that with the talent data catalog. You can go in and you can uh, schedule it. You can schedule it for a one-time run or a variety of different recurring ways. Role-based access. This is really important as well. You want to limit who has access to what data. You can do that with the talent data catalog. You can do it from a, a um, an object level, which is great because then you're limiting who has access to that sensitive data. End-to-end -end data lineage, really important. Everyone wants to know where's that data coming from? Where's it being used? What are the transformations that it's going through as it's going through its journey? It's really important to understand that. Maybe I wanna troubleshoot that um, if, I'm, if I'm an IT person or if I'm a business person, maybe I wanna know where are some of the other places that this data is being used. And then finally, broad connectivity support. So the talent data catalog has over 200 plus bridges or connectors today uh, where we can connect to a variety of different data sources. And with that, the different data sources we can connect to and grab metadata from are BI and analytics. So of course we connect to the very uh, important ones, right? Or most used, the Tableau, Power BI, MicroStrategy, ThoughtSpot, Looker. We can bring metadata from those analytics tools. We can connect to big data, you know, such as Cloudera, Hortonworks, NoSQL databases such as Mongo. Um, we can connect to, of course, our the SQL databases out there such as Oracle, MySQL, uh, SQL Server. We can also connect and grab metadata not only from CSV files, but from Avro Parquet, and then modeling tools such as Erwin and IDERA. And then finally, we can also connect to and grab metadata from the um, from ETL systems, not only just ours, but uh, SSIS and Informatica as well. So the catalog, as I mentioned before, business glossary is a very big topic. Um, and a big capability for a catalog. You wanna be able to have that shared definition because everyone has their own idea of what customer is, right? Whether it's your IT organization, whether it's HR, whether it's sales, marketing, everyone has a different, 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 different definition for that, right? And so with the catalog, it allows for a consistent definition, but it also fosters collaboration around that definition of that business term. Also, our catalog is an enterprise data catalog with the breadth of different data sources that we can connect to and bring metadata in. It, it will give you visibility to your full enterprise. It also provides versioning. This is a differentiator for our catalog. Um, you're able to go in and create different versions or think of snapshots when you're harvesting metadata. So as you're harvesting the metadata, you have those different snapshots. Uh, I like to always tell the story, we have one big uh, financial customer 
who actually wanted to go back and see what happened a year ago. And with the versioning and the catalog, they were actually able to go back and see what changed within the different systems. And then finally, dashboarding capabilities. So with the Talent Data Catalog, you can create different dashboards um, around your different roles to further um, define and, and run your uh, usage of the catalog. And with that, I am going to pass it um, over to, to Dave from Artha. So please take it away, Dave. Great, thank you very much. Let me bring up uh, my portion here. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yes. Great. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Appreciate the overview. Thanks, everyone, for being here. This is Dave Cook. Uh, I'm going to flip through just a couple of very high-level introductory slides about ARTA. Uh, we are a global uh, system integrator with business in the United States, Canada, uh, Asia, and India. Uh, we have been talent partners for several years. Uh, we are considered number one uh, in the data governance and talent data catalog uh, category. Uh, we've done well over 200 projects in uh, with Talon, with Data Fabric, all the way through uh, data governance and uh, several other areas and products that they uh, uh, sell. Uh, on the bottom line there, you can see we've got the typical partnerships with HVR, Snowflake, Microsoft, Amazon, those that you would imagine a, uh, a boutique firm such as ours that uh, specializes in data management, data integration would have. Our credentials uh, speak for themselves as far as our relationship with Talon and our capabilities as they exist on the all platforms with Talon. We are expert partners in Talent Cloud, as well as data governance. And although the Chevron is not here on the bottom, we are one of the only, if not the only, uh, expert categorized certification member of Talent Data Catalog. In terms of where we have done business, again, around the world, we've been in business a little over nine years. Uh, you will see a lot of recognizable logos here on our NASCAR slide. Uh, in, within the, the market areas on the left. This is a sample. Uh, we, like I said, we've done well over 200 projects uh, in, with Talon and uh, represent them as well on their uh, professional services side. So with that quick overview, I'm gonna send it over to my colleague, Calvin Michael, and uh, he will also uh, uh, include a demo at the end by uh, my other colleague, Saro. So, uh, with that, Calvin, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, David. So we had a really good explanation from Catherine in terms of what is the landscape and how complexity has actually taken over in terms of data and connections and the need for governance. And if you if you look at the if you look at this slide right now, the risk of non-compliance are higher than ever. Over the last decade, we're seeing close to $26 billion in fines. And this means that if there is very poor governance in terms of how organizations manage their system, there is real world consequences. And $26 billion is growing. And at the end of the day, when organizations look at the cost of compliance, it's not only the fact that the inability to be compliant with the regula regulations of today, but also the inability to innovate and provide data products that is required to succeed in this ever-changing world. And from a financial crimes perspective, the numbers uh, are actually very staggering. You're looking at close to 900 million to 1.3 billion alone in financial crimes compliance. And compliance technology has become the most important uh, transformation spending in every organization. Let me move to the next slide. When we think about 
regulatory burden and risk. This is just a snapshot in terms of the current profile of compliance around the world. Each organization will have to abide by global standards, as you could see in the items in blue. And these standards get changed on average a couple of hundred times within a couple of years. And when you look at each country, they also have a risk of uh, and regulatory compliance that is required. And so the market is becoming extremely crowded. The burden of regulatory and compliance is becoming high and organizations are struggling to be able to keep up with it. So what is the typical regulatory challenge that uh, organizations face? Well, we'd like to double click and make it real for everyone concerned here today. This is an example of a regulation called BCBS 239 or regulatory reporting. And if you look at this regulation, this is worldwide. So whether you're operating in Asia, EMEA or North America, your organization needs to be able to comply with this regulatory reporting. In a standard bank or financial services, on average, close to 2% of revenue is used to actually be in compliance with BCBS 239. It requires a headcount of close to 200 over people from the first line of defense, which is the branch, the second line of defense, which is governance, and the third line of defense, which is internal and external audit. And in order to just be able to manage BCBS 239, you need to have several items on the right-hand side, which is governance and infrastructure. You need to be able to make sure that you have the appropriate workflow and architecture to allow BCBS to be flowed through the systems. The second is you need to be able to integrate the various risk data for the ideas around accuracy, integrity, completeness, timeliness, and availability. And you may recognize the uh, risk data integration because these are exactly the sort of dimensions that governance requires as per the DM box. Next, you have to be able to look at risk reporting practices, and this is usually done within a monthly, quarterly, and yearly perspective. And then last but not least, regulatory review. So you need to be able to prove evidence that you're, you as a banking organization are in compliance with this BCBS 239 reporting. So at the end of the day, when organizations like the Banking Supervisory Committee and central banks provide guidance around this BCBS 239 regulatory reporting, they will not tell the bank how to implement this. All they will do is provide policies and expectations that each banking organization will need to flow. This is where the power of ARTA and talent comes into play. We take these complex policies that are written mostly by legislators and lawyers, and we actually translate these policies into rules. And these rules then get executed into data governance. So let me walk you through a day in the life of what a risk data steward would need to go through supporting BCBS 239. In the bottom right, you can actually see the actual report of what needs to be filed to the supervisory regulator. On the left-hand side, what you will see are really the business needs that will need to be taken care of in order to support BCBS 239. And at the top level, you could actually see the standard workflow that happens on a monthly basis when a data steward and the business steward has to present the quarterly risk reporting submission. And at every given stage in the access over here, you would be able to see when the data is not trusted and not verified. And it takes a, lot, a long time in order to be, to be able to reconcile these issues. What does timing mean? Well, in earlier stage of the, the presentation, we talked to you about the cost of non-compliance. Well, if you're not able to comply within the stipulated time, fines will occur, litigations will occur. The banks may be able to take on more risk than they, uh, they would like to. And so all these timing issues are a common occurrences in everyday life in banking. 
So now that we've seen the day in a life, we've seen the actual regulation and we've seen the growth of regulations in the organization. What is our solution? Well, we take a holistic approach. We believe that risk is not only credit market and liquidity risk, which is what most banks manage. We believe data is a principal risk along with cyber and operations. And in order to be able to protect organizations in this risk, you need to be able to have the first line of defense, which is really the line of business personnel, call center and branch employees, being able to execute the governance required. The second line of defense is really the functional areas where governance is part of the organization, but also in partnership with privacy and compliance and cyber. And last but not least, you need the third line of defense where internal audits will make sure that the policies and procedures that is required by external audit, which is the banking supervisory, is really adhered to. When you combine all these lines of defense, organizations like banking and financial services will be able to holistically manage compliance and regulatory. I will say this, right now the focus is very much focused on banking and financial services, but the same expectation would be required for privacy regulations that are cross industry, like GDPR in the United Kingdom, CCPA in California, and PDPA in Asia. So this construct of first line, second line, and third line of defense will apply for organizations above and beyond banking and financial services. So when we think about our approach to data readiness, we think about it in four dimensions. And this flows very nicely to what Catherine was talking about on the talent data fabric and talent data catalog. It starts with the policy. Arta has defined thousands of policies across multiple regulations and multiple privacy requirements around the world. And we have these policies that are written by lawyers, by regulators, and translated into systems. And that's the first thing that needs to be ingested. And we have the ability to do that. The second, each policies will make note of a very specific critical data element that the policy needs to manage. What is a critical data element? Well, for example, in GDPR or CCPA, your name, your social insurance number, your email, your phone number, these are critical data elements that fall under what we call PII or personally identifiable information. And so the critical data elements will need to be treated in a certain way and the management policies will dictate how these elements get treated. The third construct is metadata and master data management. Without being able to do the appropriate lineage and catalog the glossaries and description, and without the ability to master these critical elements, the critical elements and policies are effectively useless. So you need to some capabilities to be able to support both metadata and master data. Last but not least, we need to be able to look at the lineage. And the lineage will allow us to be able to appropriate the risk the risk from the source system all the way to the consumption system. And if you look at the key outcomes for BCBS 239, it's not about just orchestrating and managing the critical elements. It's really about making sure that there is an appropriate documentation, that the auditors can have appropriate evidence procedures, and you'd be able to measure and benchmark what the activities of governance has to be in this particular use case of BCBS 239. So on the governance holistic pr uh, perspective, as what Catherine had mentioned before, you need to be able to augment all of this. We at Arta and our sister company, Amurta, has basically contextualized all the policies, processes, which is the operating model, the risk management posture, the regulatory compliance, the quality, and most importantly, the technology, the technology that's going to sit on top of the talent data catalog and talent uh, data fabric to orchestrate the pipelines, the organization, and obviously the MDM and RDM uh, capabilities in order to be able to support it. And we have the technology that strings all of this together. So three simple steps to uh, approaching agile data governance. Why do we say Agile? Because before Arta, Amurta, and Talent had come about, most governance projects fail. It takes 12 to 18 months. 
we believe that it, there's only three simple steps and we have the technology to be able to do that. It starts obviously with the technology layer with Talent Data Fabric at its core and Talent Data Catalog. Amurta Data Insights Platform will basically be out of the box, ready for you to plug and play your regulation of your choice. As I mentioned, we have all the policies. Next is really ensuring that you have the appropriate trust. There's gold, silver, and bronze. Gold is obviously the highest level of trust, which is regulatory reporting. Silver is what we would say the operational reporting or decision support system. And then bronze is really about your data science and signals from the noise. What's, what's a data architecture without the operating model? The operating model is where people and processes come together and make decisions. It's, it's good to have the technology. It's good to understand what's wrong with the data. But if you are not able to action and uh, remediate it, it's really pointless. And so an operating model effectively takes the organization structure, the interaction model, the roles and responsibility, and the metrics that would be required in order to orchestrate governance. And what is governance if you cannot link it to data strategy? And data strategy in our case is really about compliance, which is making sure that you are able to reduce the burden and the cost of running your governance organization and obviously revenue growth. So these are the four layers in three simple way that you can actually execute agile data governance. So if we look at our proposed solu solution architecture, it's really a single plane pane of glass. Data Insights Platform is really designed, powered by obviously Talent Data Fabric, the data catalog to manage business glossaries. The glossaries, as we mentioned, we have thousands of glossaries across multiple industries, telecoms, retail, financial services, ready to be used. It is mapped against industry standard consumers will be able to appropriately understand it, will be able to profile the data, will be able to report it, will be able to uh, support stewards in governing it. And most importantly, you'll have the appropriate uh, operating model. All of these things are within a single pane of glass. You'll really have all these suites controlled in one area. My colleague Saro will be showing you a demo on how easy it is to operate and execute data governance using this single pane of glass. So what is Data Insights Platform? It's the building blocks. It allows for real-time collaboration between users. We, we automate and integrate onboarding and services at the point of ingestion. So you're effectively proactive when you're onboarding data to prevent data swamp or garbage in the system. And most importantly, you can automate governance and streamline your business reporting. What does that mean? It means that you can free up your personnel to be able to do higher value uh, work and the system will be able to take all the complexities out of your day-to-day -day operations. Here's the technical view of the solution architecture, the talent data fabric and all the associated modules at the, at the bottom, at the top, all the intellectual property, policies, rules, machine learning models that we've built into the Insights platform. And at the top level, all the interfaces so that users from an engineer all the way to a data owner can use it in the same, same instance using a single pane of glass. So with that, I am going to hand over to my colleague, Saro to take what we've shown and really bring it to life in a, in a use case, in a demo for BCBS. Over to you, Saru. Excellent. Hello, everyone. So um, before we see the Data Insights platform demo, first, I would like to touch upon the, uh, the all solution components that Alvin explained to you just now. So to make your data ready for BCBS 239, as Kelvin explained, we need to have these four components. Uh, one is the data and uh, policy management, the critical data elements, and how we tie those together along with our uh, core data to manage metadata and master data. And finally, lead. So first for policy, 
So here you can see, this is our data insights platform where we have uh, all the uh, facilities that are needed for compliance uh, uh, maintenance in a single pane of glass. So first component talks about the policy. Uh, so here is our policy engine. Here you can see we have all the policies which are pre-configured and readily available for us to uh, apply to our data. You can see GDPR, uh, BCBS 239, CBK regulations, et cetera. So our policy engine is going to help you in operationalizing the uh, compliance execution. So next is our critical data elements and then the data management. So that is going to be taken care of by our data governance cockpit, where we are going to look into our uh, rich pre-configured uh, glossary package and how we are going to uh, integrate it with our talent data catalog. Uh, and then how from there, how we can see the data lineage. So that is what we are going to see today. So before I show you how we configure all these items, how we make it work to see um, the uh, compliance implementation. First, I want to show you the value or the intelligence that our data insights platform will deliver to you. Uh, let's say uh, as, a, as a regulatory um, <clears throat> steward, First, I would like to have a collective view or a bird's view of my um, data assets that I have in my organization. So where we stand as an organization with respect to compliance. So how our data health is uh, doing. So where we are lagging, where we have to focus. So all those things uh, have to be available uh, in a single uh, screen. So that's what our dashboard is going to provide you. So here you can see we have a lot of dashboards which will help you uh, give a better understanding of where you are standing with respect to your uh, data compliance. Um, so this first dashboard is going to show you the top performing data assets. So these are the different data assets you have and these are the top performing data assets. So you can see the uh, trust index score of this data asset is very good. It's 93%. Uh, and then only the negative is very less. So it's going to give you which area is doing better. And same way, it's going to tell you, uh, the other dashboard is going to tell you what, how many total metadata has been harvested from where those metadata are coming from. Source-wise, it is going to give you the count. Uh, and the next is uh, business glossary. The glossary elements is what we looked for, right? So this dashboard is going to tell you how many business terms have been inferred and how many are yet to uh, infer. And same way, it's going to tell you uh, the uh, domain-wise, how many are uh, 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 the how many data elements were published already, which means like it's finalized and accepted across the organization, and how many are yet to publish. This is again domain-wise. You can click the domain and see for various options. So these are the positive side. Let's say like I want to know the, the data assets which are not performing good. So which are the bottom two and the top two data assets that you can see from here and the trust score as well. Uh, same way you want to see the trend of your uh, compliance over a period of time. For example, uh, what is the trend over uh, for each quarter or what is the trend over it uh, on a daily basis? So the trend of the data compliance can be monitored here using these two uh, dashboards. And you also have the, the count of the total uh, data assets process and how many sources you have, how many domains are being impacted. So this dashboard section will give you a collective, a good overview of where you stand with respect to your data compliance. And also you can have a detailed view of all the data assets you have. Uh, so let's say you want to have a look of particular data asset, and then you want to see where it is standing with respect to compliance. So you can have the uh, data assets here, you can search for it, and then you can have a look at those data assets. So you can see here, it will take you to the uh, detail screen to show you the health of the individual data assets. So when you, so, so this covers the uh, overview of uh, uh, the data compliance uh, state. But when you actually do in your uh, daily uh, real life uh, data compliance, 
you obviously will have a lot of incidents uh, coming in the future. So you have to have uh, you have to deal with a lot of incidents and you have to track them and you, have, you know you need to know where you are uh, with respect to the incidents. Uh, um, be it uh, your uh, internal audit or anything, it could be anything related to data. So let's see where we are. Um, so how do we know? So how the uh, data insights platform is going to help you uh, with respect to your incidents that you are tracking? Well, so here you can see another set of dashboards. Uh, these dashboards are totally customizable. Uh, based on the slicing and dicing that you want to have, you can customize these dashboard reports. Um, so I've created a couple of them for demo purpose. So you can see, so, uh, so the incident, who it has been assigned to, and what is the severity of the incident. Based on that, you can have a dashboard. Uh, based on the due date you want to see, you can have the dashboard. And then uh, the data asset-wise, so which one has the higher set of incidents, and where all the other incidents stand. So you can have a uh, dashboard for that. And then uh, you, let's say like if the doesn't cover what you need, you can have your own custom dashboard added. So you have a add report option. So you can pick a, a kind of a chart that you want to have with a bar graph or a heat map or a pie chart or anything. So you just have to uh, add the uh, chart and then you just have to name it, and then you can have the options to pick. So you can either have the um, data asset wise, or let's say you have want to have the department wise, or the business function wise. So you can have a, any any uh, kind of chart that you would like to see with respect to your incidents, uh, or it could be policy wise, or control wise, or the rule wise. So we can add your own custom uh, dashboards here in this section. So now we saw the um, view as a regulatory steward on an organizational level. At the enterprise level, how do I um, see my health uh, with the dashboards and how do I see uh, my incidents and the concern the dashboard? Let's say now I want to go into a specific data asset, which I'm interested in, and I want to go deep dive into the health of that particular data asset, um, which has my uh, list of elements uh, that I'm interested in, my critical data elements. Well, so this is our detailed uh, data metrics uh, screen where you can see this is my data asset, customer transaction. Uh, I'm interested in looking into the health uh, and compliance of the elements within this data asset. So this screen is going to give me the uh, overall trust index score of my data asset. And it's going, it will also give you the list of dashboards which will help you uh, to do the uh, further route of analysis um, or uh, how to improve the compliance, health, et cetera. So the first dashboard I would like to touch upon is the policy compliance. So here, Kelvin explained to you like how we are going to marry or how we are going to roll down the policy to controls to rules and then to apply to the data. So I can show you when I go to the rules configuration, I'll show you how we do that. But uh, this is the report which will tell you the compliance with respect to your data. So it, this has two sections. One is a compliance set of elements and non-compliance set of elements. So for which policy, for which control, and for which rule, this element is compliant or not compliant. So that's what it's going to tell you. So for this particular policy, this element is 100% compliant. Whereas if you go to the non-compliant section, it looks like the authorizer name for this particular policy and control, it is not completely compliant. It's going to give the trust index score. So this will give you a clear picture of where you are with respect to each and every element that you have in your um, uh, data asset. So you can pick for another policy and see like for that particular policy, how the data elements are doing, whether they are compliant or non-compliant. So based on that, you can have uh, uh, you can have the incidence management to log the issues and track, and then make the data compliant 100%. So the regular uh, data governance dimensions. Apart from that, we also have to take care of quality as part of the risk as well. So there are a lot of data quality dimensions uh, we have covered, like completeness, correctness, consistency, and so on. So you can see each 
section lists the critical data elements for which we have applied the concerned uh, dimension rule and it's going to give you the health of each element here separately. So you can click the element to view the uh, details like uh, which records are failed and which records are passed uh, and so on. So uh, like how we had the trending, uh, quarterly trending or the daily trending for our overall organizational level, we do have the trending for the data asset level also. You can see for each element how your data trends uh, over a period of time. So this will give you a clear picture of whether you are improving with respect to compliance implementation or there is it anywhere going wrong. So it, it, it helps in continuous monitoring of your uh, compliance. And data asset scorecard is another good view. It gives a, a slicing and dicing uh, using the rules or the categories or the subcategories. Uh, the dimensions used or from which data source it comes. Uh, this kind of really helps in the root cause analysis. So you want to see like which part of the, uh, the process is actually contributing uh, issues uh, for the compliance implementation. So that kind of root cause analysis can be done easily with data asset scorecard. And we also have the product 360 view is going to give you the uh, policy dashboards. So it's going to, uh, you, can, you can see, uh, we have a lot of policies defined which are very specific to uh, the uh, each CD, uh, the privacy policies, security policies, and data retention, data disaster recovery, and role-based access also. So all these dashboards you can see here in this section. So with this, we are uh, actually covering all the uh, intelligence or the values that uh, you can get out of a data insights platform. So to get all these values, so we have to do a couple of steps before that. So we have to do the uh, configuration process, which is a one-time process. So once you do the, the uh, configuration and set the data asset, and you're good to go. So you can run your assets uh, how many number of times you want and you can keep on going. So to do that configuration, two main things are required. One, yes, we have to identify our business uh, elements, the terms, and then we have to have the business velocity established, and then we have to have the validations. So that's what we are going to see next. So this is our business glossary section. So in our business glossary section, we have covered uh, all the major uh, business domains we have, and our package comes with a rich pre-configured uh, glossary elements which are readily available for you to use. Uh, for example, I'm in the business dom uh, banking domain, as you can see. So we have a lot of categories, and under each category, we have all the subcategories and uh, all these elements are available for you to readily use immediately. So uh, let's say like you have your own specific set of elements or you have your elements uh, in the talent data catalog. So that is a key thing that um, we want to have uh, an integrated uh, solution. So you will have your data lineage and the glossary terms in a talent data catalog. And you want to have the compliance implemented in data insights platform. Well, how do we marry those two together? How do we uh, uh, handshake together so we have a seamless, complete solution? So that can be done using the uh, talent data catalog handshake. So here we have the option to uh, import the glossary elements from TDC, as well as we can publish the uh, changed glossary elements or anything back to TDC. So both ways is uh, doable here. So we can, I'll just quickly showcase how do we uh, import glossary. So these are the steps involved. So we'll go to the TDC glossary, we select the categories of the attributes, and then if there is any conflict, let's say that same element name is already existing or some conflicts might occur. So we, there is a screen to uh, resolve the conflicts. And finally, we can review and add those to our data insights platform. Same way we can uh, publish our set of uh, uh, CDs to a uh, talent data catalog. So here you can see, you can pick the domain and the talent data ca catalog glossary and uh, the eight elements that we have in our data insights platform. 
and then assign it to the CDC category so that we can successfully uh, push our elements to CDC. So this will be really helpful when we want to have one integrated solution where we have the, the compliance implementation and data insights platform. Uh, at the same time, we have the data lineage uh, uh, in the data, uh, data and data catalog. So how do we club both together? So this handshake is critical and important. So, so Sadhu, I think uh, let's uh, pause for a minute and uh, let's ask the questions if uh, anything else anybody want to see. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I, I do have some questions. This is Dave again. Uh, we've had a, 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 a few questions. A few of them have already been answered, I believe. Uh, the first question, uh, let me read this. What is the typical implementation for a data governance project? Uh, let's see, Kelvin, would you like to address that one? Yeah, so the, the, the typical um, uh, timeline for the data governance project using our solution is anywhere between 12 to 20 weeks. And uh, it involves really about configuring and tailoring the business requirements against the use cases and the business outcomes. And we do that through the orchestration of the policies uh, within our platform. Excellent, excellent. Uh, next question, uh, we've got time for a couple more here. Uh, this one is, we already have Talon data fabric licenses. What other Talon products do we need for data governance? Uh, that's probably a good one for Catherine. Um, thanks, David. Um, Great to know that you're already a Talon customer. Um, you actually have a lot of the pieces that you'll need um, for a data governance solution. So as I talked about earlier, um, and I answered in the chat, data quality is a huge component of data governance. So with the data fabric, you have the data quality pieces, which are, are key. And then you just need the catalog to fully support data governance. So that would be the only thing that you're missing but with those, you'll have a, a powerful solution to address any of your data governance uh, concerns. Excellent, thank you, Catherine. And I think we, we might have time for one more. Uh, let's see, this is a quick one. Uh, whether the solution you demonstrated can handle structured or unstructured data, that's a question. Uh, Calvin, you wanna address that one? Yeah, that's great. Um, because we are handling privacy regulations, um, we are organized to be able to ingest structured, semi-structured and unstructured data. And the system will be able to apply its uh, machine learning algorithms against those data sets. So the answer is yes. Excellent, excellent. Well, I think we'll move to close here. Uh, Carrie, would you like to uh, close this out? Um, yes, thank you everybody for joining. Super appreciate it. And we will be sending you a $25 Lunch and Learn gift certificate since we weren't able to meet with you live and look forward to having you join our next webinar. So again, thanks and have a great day.